Story One of Young Readers Science Fiction Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Young Readers Science Fiction Stories by Richard Mace Elam. Story One Beth and the Twilight Star beth harrison and her father had driven into the desert to look for dead branches of a jumping cactus which were used in making lamps for mr harrison's tourist shop in tucson he and beth had just gotten out of the station wagon and were gazing up a slope of bristly cacti this looks like a good place daddy beth said mr harrison nodded we'll have to hurry though it's getting late they started up the sandy slope carrying straw market bags that would hold their gleanings maybe we'll see some flying saucers beth said half jokingly someone thought he saw one out here the other day her father grinned flying saucers indeed you and that lively imagination of yours beth they set to work searching for dead branches they found a few good specimens but they were not enough to suit beth and she decided to broaden the search she went over the slope and up and down another and before long her roaming carried her out of sight of her father amidst the stunning colors of the sunset beth could make out a lone star sirius the brightest true star in all the sky it reminded her of a pearl glowing in the heavens presently beth had a bag full of cactus wood for the lamp shop she was about to return to her father when suddenly she saw something ahead that she had not noticed before almost hidden within a dense thicket of smoky green palo verde was a shiny surface that reflected the dying sun's rays her imagination stirred beth decided to investigate she put down her bag and made her way into the thicket as she moved carefully through the thorns she found some of the branches pushed aside as if someone had used this path before she was almost through when she tripped and fell head first her forehead bumped against an unyielding branch causing her to see more than one star this time she didn't know how long she lay on the ground half stunned before she got to her feet there was a painful bruise on her forehead but her curiosity was still strong and she went on the shiny surface turned out to be a wall as smooth and glossy as steel jeepers beth thought what can it be she reached out to touch the wall before she could do so a door opened in the wall the first thing she noticed beyond was a soft yellow light filling a handsome room feeling like alice on the threshold of wonderland she stepped inside more thrilled than afraid she heard a sighing behind her and saw the door closing shut only then did she become frightened she beat against the wall wishing that she had not been so rash as to venture into such a strange place she heard a voice say that will not help beth turned and saw a girl of about her own age standing on a richly carpeted platform across the room the odd unearthliness of the girl struck beth immediately she was pretty and her skin was milky white her costume seemed to be of a blue phosphorescent material as did her shoes her short hair was almost as red as glowing coals well, well, who are you beth stammered i am linnea the girl replied in a voice that sounded almost as if she were singing you are beth yes beth replied in amazement but how did you i can read your mind beth gulped you can come over here and sit down linnea said we shall talk she sat in a nearby chair that seemed to be made of steel matchsticks it looked so frail beth sat in the chair opposite and found that it was very sturdy you are thinking that i look very strange to you linnea said you seem strange to me too but that is because we are of different worlds beth gulped again D -d -d different worlds suddenly the yellow light in the room changed to a pulsing orange linnea straightened up quickly that is the signal she spoke i did not expect it so soon we must hurry and prepare ourselves beth started asking questions but linnea said not now beth found herself following the girl across the room to a row of couches beth lay down on one and somehow knew exactly what she was to do she guessed that linnea was putting the thoughts into her head 
she lifted the straps that hung at the sides and buckled them across her body the couch was soft as a cloud and beth was thinking how much she would like to have a bed like this when all at once she felt herself sinking deeply into the cushion as if a great hand were thrusting her down for several moments she was as giddy as if she were riding the roller coaster at the carnival then finally her breath came back and she felt herself rise to the top of the cushion again we can get up now she heard linnea say we're coasting now they unbuckled their straps and rose to their feet linnea walked over to the wall pressed a button and a blind rolled back revealing a long window look linnea said beth joined her and looked out the window her heart fairly rose into her throat she was up in the sky far up in the sky through a veil of clouds beneath she could see the curve of the earth itself beth seized linnea by the arm jeepers what's going on where are you taking me linnea pointed to the white beacon of sirius in the blue-black sky you're from sirius beth asked in amazement yes from tatamuri one of its planets our work on earth is through for right now and my father and i are returning home to make a report linnea went on to say that her father's spaceship was only one of many which were studying the earth to see how the people here lived her father's assignment had been to make an analysis of the soil the visitors intended no harm and in time they planned to meet the people of earth face to face well i have already met you beth said boldly and i'm ready to go back linnea shook her flame-topped head we tried to keep our ship hidden but you found it beth and so there is nothing to do but take you back with us for a while when you came close the electric eye opened the door and let you inside before it was time for any earth person to see one of our ships but my father and mother beth said desperately and my friends they'll be worried to death you must not take me linnea please isn't there something you can do linnea studied beth's pleading face and then she replied i'll talk to my father he's busy running the ship but i'll do what i can for you while i'm gone you can see what it's like on our world by pushing the button on that cabinet against the wall father and i look at the film sometimes to keep from getting homesick beth was in no mood for looking at pictures she was feeling worse by the minute as she considered what it would be like to be parted from her family and friends as she sat in the chair dreading and wondering suddenly it became too much for her and she began to cry jeepers why did i ever wander off from daddy she moaned the tears made her feel better and presently she was calm enough to go over to the cabinet and turn it on a large screen brightened and she saw a strange land unfolding before her eyes there were winding highways raised into the sky and skyscrapers like tall crystal columns she saw motor cars of teardrop design and helicopters filling the air the people looked much like linnea with phosphorescent clothing and all had hair as flaming red as linnea's own yes tatamuri looked like an exciting place to visit but it was not a visit beth would want to make without another person from her own planet as she thought about her predicament she began to be scared again and the tears filled her eyes once more why sirius was trillions of miles from earth she went to the window the dwindling earth was becoming a green ball against the black deeps of space the stars were dazzling and seemed as countless as the sands of the seashore the view made beth terribly homesick finally linnea returned beth looked at her anxiously trying to read her fate in the foreign girl's eyes what did your father say beth asked with fluttering heart did he say he'd take me back please tell me he did linnea smiled yes beth he said that we are not supposed to take younger persons to tatamuri he was angry with me for not telling him you were aboard but i told him you came in just before we blasted off gee i'm so relieved beth said happily i don't mean i wouldn't like your company linnea but you know how it is yes i know linnea replied wistfully i have missed my mother and friends too i had to take my brother's place on this trip when he became sick you see everyone on tatamuri learns science when they are very young 
i've been wondering how it is that you speak english linia we keep tuned in on your radio and television linia answered that's how we learned your language and so many other things about you you people seem to be ahead of us in progress beth said i believe there is much we can learn from you we can learn much from you too linia spoke i hope the people of our planets are permitted to meet very soon the girls had to belt down on their couches again because of the mounting speed at which they were returning to earth beth felt herself sinking deeply into her cushion once more and she grew breathless again minutes later the ship stopped moving beth hurriedly unbuckled and ran over to the window through a break in the palo verde thicket she could see her father's station wagon parked at the roadside she was back at the same place she had started from thank goodness she breathed linia walked with her to the outer door my father said he'd like to have met you linia said but he is too busy preparing for our blast-off again we must hurry because we are behind schedule before you leave beth father has said that you must promise never to speak a word about all this to anyone i have searched your mind and i know you to be honest beth was disappointed that she could not make known her fabulous journey but she promised that she would never tell linia waved her hand at the door and the electric eye opened it good-bye beth linia said good-bye linia beth heard the sighing of the door as it closed behind her suddenly her head began aching and she remembered the fall she had taken earlier as she made her way out of the thicket she began to have a queer feeling about her adventure it made her wonder if perhaps she might not have been unconscious and imagined the whole thing when she reached the car her father said with some concern you were gone so long i started to come for you beth what happened to your forehead she told him about her fall but did not mention the spaceship did you see something land a few minutes ago daddy beth asked mr harrison grinned you mean maybe a flying saucer no i'm afraid i didn't are you sure your imagination isn't working overtime again beth as they were about to get into the car beth saw a dark object in the distance rise from the ground and move off into the deepening twilight she was certain she did not imagine this you saw that didn't you daddy beth asked mr harrison nodded oh probably a hawk hmm looks like it's heading right for the evening star doesn't it beth gazed at the brilliant light of sirius gorgeously bright now with darkness closing in i wish i knew if it really was beth murmured end of story one Story two of Young Readers Science Fiction Stories by Richard Mace Elam. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story two Gib takes a space test. Gib Bromfield was nine, and the thing he wanted to do most was to make a flight into space. A colony on the moon had already been started for scientific research, and a huge man made space platform circled the earth once every twenty four hours i want to go back to the moon with you father gim would plead every time mr broomfield came home on a furlough i'm afraid you're still a little young gib his father would reply some day you will be able to go out into space with me but not yet mr broomfield was a construction engineer and he was helping to build a big spaceport on the moon he came home to see his family every six months each time he returned, Gib couldn't wait to meet him at the front door of their prefabricated home. Gib would shake hands with him like a man and take his bags from him. Then he would step back and admire the tall, handsome man in the glossy black boots and gray uniform of the space service. By this time, Mother usually came running up, followed by Sandra, Gib's little sister. On Mr. Bromfield's latest visit, Gib waited until the usual family talk had subsided before he started asking his father about his recent adventures. After father had brought him up to date, Gib asked the same question he always asked. Father, may I go back with you this time for a short visit, just a short one? Mr. Bromfield smiled and rumpled Gib's blonde hair. It's not the time element, Gib, he said patiently. It's the rigors of space itself which are much rougher than Captain Rocket on TV would have us believe. Gibbs' face fell. 
he had hoped that this time his father would give in and let him go back mr bromfield could see that his son was disappointed he stared at gibb thoughtfully for a moment then spoke again all right gibb i'll put you through s q t if you pass it and still want to go spaceward i'll take you gee do you mean that gibb burst out he was so excited he didn't know what to do gibb had never had any doubt that he would pass the s q t the space qualification test that all those who go spaceward must take mr bromfield went immediately to the video phone and put through a call to s q t having them place gibb's name on the space test list thanks father gibb said excitingly at last i'll be going spaceward we'll see mr bromfield replied soberly gibb spent the next afternoon on the first part of the test which was a complete physical examination it didn't hurt the tiniest bit gibb joked with his father that night if all the parts of the test are as easy as this first one i won't have any trouble mr bromfield did not say anything but he smiled to himself as though he knew something that gibb did not know gibb and his father took the elevated expressway to the s q t center early the next morning in their atom-powered johnson superjet the final portions of gibb's test would be covered today. the first part was familiarity with the spacesuit in company with about fifty other candidates gibb was given a supply of clothing then every one was shown how to zip up their thickly insulated suits in front next an attendant snapped metal cylinders to their shoulders and screwed the flexible tubings into valves on their suits last to be put on were helmets of light metal that had a darkened glass in front so that the wearer could look out now all of you turn a little black knob on your chests the tester said his voice sounded muffled to gibb because of the helmet he wore gibb turned his knob and felt his suit blowing up like a balloon as air flowed in from the oxygen tanks this is how you would be dressed for a walk on the moon the tester told them now i want all of you to walk into the next room as gibb went into the room with the others he was thinking how easy the test had been up until now and what fun it was taking the very tests that captain rocket himself must have taken at one time he thought his father was surely mistaken for having doubted his ability to pass the s q t the tester left the room and shut the door in a few moments gibb began to have a strange sensation he was feeling lighter and lighter and the others with him were beginning to float right off the floor gibb struggled frantically as he felt himself go off balance each movement he made however shot him off at swift crazy angles he felt himself sweating with fear and for the first time he was believing that maybe the s q t wasn't going to be so easy after all it seemed as if he had the strength of a samson but it was a strength he could not control a simple kick sent him hurtling across the room toward the wall he tried to break himself but nothing he did would stop him he crashed headlong into the wall it shook him up a little but he was not hurt he saw that the wall was thickly padded after about fifteen minutes of helplessness gibb felt himself getting heavier again and saw his companions drop to the floor in normal position the tester came in with some doctors the doctors looked over each candidate and asked many questions gibb was still dazed and wasn't sure of the answers he gave when the doctors were through the tester explained what had happened this room was degravitized which means the earth's gravity in here was cut off by mechanical means it's the same condition you will find in a spaceship when the gravity plates are turned off from the looks of some of you this experience was something of a shock but the final test will be even rougher anybody who wants to drop out now may do so gibb saw that about a third of the candidates had had enough gibb was still giddy himself and started to join them he was disappointed in the harshness of zero gravity it had always looked so simple to him the way that captain rocket swam about in his rocket flyer gibb did not want his father to think him a quitter though and decided to stick out the test to the end when his turn came he was led into a huge room by himself and up to a queer-looking machine 
it resembled one of the thrill rides at a carnival the one that whirls you round and round like a ball on the end of a string gib entered a tiny cabin at the end of the large swinging arm and sat down in a thick foam rubber reclining chair as he was strapped down the tester said to him this is called the centrifuge sun and it simulates the blast off from earth in a rocket ship you appear to be a little young to be taking it so if you've had enough just yank that lever in front of you and we'll stop the machine uh, i will gib replied getting scared already he got more scared as all sorts of instruments were strapped to him the tester explained that these were to record his reactions as the door was closed on him gib had a trapped feeling then he composed himself and waited for the worst telling himself that a spaceman must be brave presently he felt the cabin begin to move slowly at first this much was fun gib thought just like the carnival ride as the cabin picked up speed it was even more thrilling but then as the speed increased still more gib began to lose his enjoyment faster and faster he went and gib was crushed deeply into the chair cushion he felt his cheeks draw back from his teeth the corners of his eyes making him squint there was heavy pressure on his chest as if an elephant were standing on him his breath hung in his throat and he saw strange colors and darting forms before his eyes he stood the agonizing effect as long as he could and then his frightfully heavy hand crept unsteadily toward the lever in front of him and jerked it the cabin began losing speed and finally stopped gib saw a blurred image open the door and offer his hand as he stumbled out his head feeling big as a watermelon gib vaguely remembered hearing the tester say you needn't feel badly about this son you almost lasted it out come back in another year or two and then i think you'll be able to pass gib still wasn't quite himself as he met his father in the waiting room he was quivering all over and his dad wouldn't quite come into focus i flunked the test father gib told him it sounds to me as if you're glad you did mr bromfield replied with a chuckle i was afraid it might be too rough for you son but i knew there was no other way to show you that space travel isn't as easy as the comic books make out i'll try again next year gibbs said or the year after that anyway that's what the tester told me i'm sure you'll be ready then mr bromfield replied now what do you say we go home captain rocket is almost due on tv end of story two Story three of Young Readers Science Fiction Stories by Richard Mace Elam. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story three The Space Mail Run. The way he felt now, Jerry Welsh was almost sorry he had left Earth. The moonship landing seemed to be crushing the very life out of him, although he lay flat on a couch to ease the strain. Jerry turned his head toward his father, who was strapped down like himself and suffering too the craft was under its own control for no human could withstand the rocket's present speed and still be able to steer in for a landing captain welsh was on his bi-weekly mail run to luna the moon and for the first time in ten years of service he had a passenger his own twelve-year-old son at last jerry felt a hard jolt under him he knew the rocket's tail fins had finally touched ground jerry unstrapped himself with rubbery fingers and sat up then he tried to stand but flopped down again wow i feel giddy he groaned his father laughed you'll get your bearings presently son how long jerry had waited to make this space mail run with his father then finally last year captain welsh had said that jerry could go with him when he became twelve as he was especially husky and strong for his age but now that the great moment had come at last jerry wasn't sure he was enjoying it as he had expected for he had found space so vast so dark and so frightening do you still want to be a spaceman jerry his father asked suddenly as though jerry had spoken his thoughts aloud i i think so dad he replied hesitantly i see you're doubtful jerry captain welch said i won't put you on the spot so early 
they climbed into space gear electrically heated suits and clear plastic helmets fitted with radios lastly they donned oxygen tanks and flooded their suits with the life-sustaining gas they gathered up the mail sacks and climbed down the ladder to the ground heading for the largest of a group of buildings which made up moon haven center of earthman's activity on the airless planet the stars burned fantastically bright overhead traces of frost topped the distant lunar alps it was incredibly cold out here for the moon was in its two-week period of night captain welsh got a receipt for the largest mail bag and then he and jerry went out a rear door of the building carrying the rest an atom-powered mail car awaited them it had an open top and huge wheels that looked like saw-toothed gears climb aboard the moon jeep jerry his father said we've got ten mail deliveries to make inside captain welsh pulled down a section of the dash panel revealing a map here's a map of our route there aren't many mail stops on the moon yet but they're all important and the mail must go through jerry added captain welsh nodded soberly well that's the first law jerry as they moved off jerry saw the big friendly globe of earth hanging like a green jewel halfway up the jet black sky he wondered what his mother and baby sister were doing this moment a quarter of a million miles away captain welsh showed jerry how to run the jeep jerry found this easy for he had already had a course in mechanics in preparation for his future career as a spaceman but some time later their peaceful ride was interrupted when captain welsh suddenly leaned over and grabbed the wheel jerry was thrown to the side as the car swerved the vehicle straightened out and slammed to a halt as his father controlled the wheel and applied the brakes what happened jerry breathed his heart pounding his father pointed behind them look jerry turned and saw the edge of a treacherous ditch running right across the roadway where they would have passed over the gorge was several feet wide i didn't even see it jerry murmured sick with fear at what might have happened this wasn't the first time he'd been shaken on this journey it made him wonder as he had once before if he had what it took to be a spaceman or if this adventure would make him decide never to leave the atmosphere of earth again scared his father asked jerry nodded don't worry i was too for a moment you were jerry asked with surprise fear was given to man so he could save himself from danger jerry captain welsh said don't be ashamed of it fear is nothing to be ashamed of unless you let it get the best of you never forget that they arrived at their first delivery point an engineering project on a plateau surrounded by mountains there were the foundations of great buildings to come constructed of hard lunar granite the space-suited figures came running when they recognized captain welsh and his mail car jerry marveled how the formerly stern expression of the workmen brightened when the foreman handed mail out to them it must be fun bringing mail to men who are so far from their homes and families jerry said when they were on their way again i guess that's why i've put up with the lonely hours of seeing nothing but stardust for the past ten years captain welsh answered but i love it son and i wouldn't trade jobs with any man their next delivery site was a cavern where men were prospecting for uranium they too were overjoyed at receiving messages from home the jeep rolled on from there to a huge plane which was being prepared for a future spaceport captain welsh and his helper dropped off another mail sack and then were on their way again some hours later all but two deliveries had been made next stop is the astronomy observatory captain welsh told jerry they crawled over sandy hills that taxed the gripping power of their spiked wheels wound in and out of towering buttresses of black basalt and bored through natural tunnels like a pair of human moles then the observatory came into view a smiling little scientist with thick glasses signed for the mail at the door he invited jerry to come back and visit the place before he returned to earth you haven't seen anything until you look through their great telescope captain welsh told jerry as they drove off what's our last stop jerry wanted to know a geology camp where some scientists are digging into ancient rocks his father said 
it's only about seven miles away but the going will be a little rough before we get there it's a good thing it's our last stop because we don't have any too much oxygen left in our shoulder tanks i usually don't take this long on a mail run the roadway carried them through a narrow pass with a high hill of loose rock on one side and a sloping embankment on the other jerry's first warning of trouble came when he was flung suddenly forward he heard the sickening drag of the wheels as his father's boot hit the brakes just ahead of them he saw a cascade of rocks sliding down the hill the next moment jerry felt an even harder blow as the jeep was grazed by one of the large boulders the small car was swept out of the roadway like a toy and rammed against a pillar at the cliff edge jerry screamed in fear as he felt himself being thrown out of the car he struck the ground hard and began rolling head over heels down the precipice when the numbing shock of his fall had worn off jerry climbed dazedly to his feet and looked up the slope down which he had been thrown dad he cried he slipped and scrambled up the incline in reckless haste he found captain welsh sprawled unconscious just below the upper brink of the precipice jerry knelt and looked into his face through the clear plastic helmet his father's eyes were closed and there was an ugly bruise on his forehead where it must have struck the helmet in his fall what am i going to do jerry groaned aloud he himself would have to make the decisions and carry them through if the two of them were to survive it was a shocking thought then it came to him what his father had said about fear a person need never be ashamed of fear so long as it was not permitted to get the upper hand jerry pulled his father up onto the roadway and tried to bring him around but without result jerry examined the jeep one side was badly smashed but the engine still appeared sound the car was tipped over against the rock column jerry was thankful that the jeep was only one-sixth of its earth weight on the moon it was a tremendous effort but he finally righted the car and got it back on the road he jumped into the front seat and started the engine it sputtered and then hummed into activity jerry studied the map on the panel he located their present position by the giant crater plato at his distant right then he traced the winding route leading to the geology camp he was closer to the camp than the observatory but ahead lay a rugged route one with which jerry was totally unfamiliar he got out and went back to where captain welsh lay which way should i go dad ahead or back he asked helplessly just as though his father were able to answer him something told him that captain welsh would want him to go ahead to finish the mail run that had never missed a round in ten years jerry got his father into the back seat then gunned the jeep and struck off into the unknown ahead he was thankful for the old worn trail that led the way for him it presently carried him through a gloomy valley jerry switched on his headlights but the twin spears of brightness gave him little comfort in the spooky place grotesque rock columns rose like menacing ghosts on both sides of him at last he was out in the open again the road led him around the steep edge of a yawning crater evidently caused by a huge crashing fireball from outer space jerry carefully guided the jeep along the dangerous cliff if one of his wheels should slip over the side it would be a fall to frightful death a hundred feet straight down at last even this peril was passed and jerry drove up a gradual incline over bare rock to a bluff that overlooked the distant land for many miles the camp he said joyfully that's it below only a few miles away he followed a curve that swept on to the plain below when he was on a level again it seemed that all his troubles were over he felt better by the moment as he drove closer and closer to his destination then without warning his wheels began to bog down in a pumice mire his heart did a flip-flop and he checked the map he saw a warning to drivers to avoid this spot in his overconfidence he had blundered right into it he gave the little jeep full power it jerked crazily through the clinging stuff over to the right the pumice seemed to thin out and farther over he could see the roadway he should have taken he swung his wheels to the right and the jeep lurched through the gray sand using up a lot of power 
but making little progress for minutes on end jerry gave the jeep all it had and he could hear its engine laboring tiredly suddenly the motor died jerry tried to start it again but could not he checked his temperature gauge the engine was extremely hot from the continual use of top power from his mechanical school course jerry realized the rotors had frozen and that it wouldn't run again until they had cooled off as he waited impatiently for the engine to cool a warning voice in his mind was saying your oxygen is getting lower by the second if the jeep doesn't get out of here within the next fifteen minutes you and your dad will never make it jerry shook off the terrible thoughts he stamped his feet to warm them the electric circuit in his suit seemed to be breaking down if it collapsed completely he would be frozen instantly by the lunar cold jerry massaged his dad's hands and legs in case his suit too was getting colder he worked steadily until his hands ached then he checked the gauge again it was falling slowly but heavy insulation was still keeping the engine hot at last jerry decided he should not wait any longer with a prayer on his lips he pressed the starter button the engine rumbled sluggishly coughed then quickened to full strength he jammed the fuel pedal hard and tried to guide the jeep's swirling spinning motion through the lunar sand slowly the little car pulled itself like a weary swimmer toward the firm bank finally the wheels found good traction and the jeep lurched onto the roadway jerry heaved a tremendous sigh and sped down the path toward the geology camp less than an hour later jerry was being permitted into the room of one of the huts where his father had been carried for examination by the camp physician jerry had been told that his father had suffered a slight concussion but that he would be all right captain welsh smiled from his cot as jerry walked in hi spaceman his father greeted the doctor says the men here were mighty happy to get their mail on time i'm glad i came on here then instead of going back to the observatory jerry murmured you did the job in the best tradition of the space mail service jerry captain welsh said smiling proudly if i had any doubts that you'd be able to follow me some day son they're gone now jerry nodded happily a few doubts had been removed from his own mind in the past hour end of story three story four of young readers science fiction stories by richard mace elam this librivox recording is in the public domain story four all aboard for space it had already been a wonderful birthday for the twins sue and steve shannon when their father asked how about it kids are you ready for that space ride i promised sue's big hazel eyes looked like walnuts as she stared in surprise steve's blue eyes were more like plums could they really believe what they were hearing i said i'd take you on that ride when you two reached twelve didn't i mr shannon went on they hadn't forgotten and were suddenly as excited as two young ducks who have just discovered water mr shannon looked at his watch we'd better get ready the next flight is at four o'clock less than a half hour later mrs shannon was bidding good-bye to the three as they climbed into the family helicopter on the roof of their home in this year of two thousand and four nearly everybody owned a copter mrs shannon had been invited to go along but she said no coaxing in the world could get her up in one of those rocket things the overhead doors of the garage swung open as mrs shannon pushed the button on the wall as soon as the three riders were comfortably seated mr shannon started up the engine and the overhead blade began churning gently the copter lifted into the blue sky and headed out over the city I can't really believe we're going to take a trip into space sue said happily some day i'm going to be a spaceman and travel to all the planets steve declared the plane passed over beautiful triple-decked highways over green farms loaded with scientific equipment and solar mirrors over plastic domed skyscrapers presently a large oval appeared just ahead there's the spaceport sue exclaimed when mr shannon got the signal to land he brought the helicopter down into the parking lot at the edge of the port 
Then the three jumped out onto the ground. As they walked toward the main building, the twins excitedly noticed the busy activity of the field. What impressed them most were the massive torpedo-shaped rockets which were half buried in their concrete launching pits. "'Where is that biggest rocket going, Dad?' Steve asked. When his father said it was going to the moon, a tingle raced up the boy's spine, and all at once he wished he could be on the ship himself. "'There's our rocket over there,' Mr. Shannon said, pointing to a smaller craft of lightweight beryllium metal just across the way. Near the pit was a sign that read, "'Space Rides Daily. Enjoy the thrill of a lifetime a thousand miles above Earth.' Mr. Shannon got their tickets. Then, after a heart check-up, they waited in line with the other eager sightseers. Finally, the spaceport officer took down the chain that held back the crowd and permitted them to approach the rocket. They had to cross a bridge to get from the pit edge into the ship. As they crossed, Steve looked down into the hot pit and saw clouds of flame and smoke pouring from the great jet tubes. In the ship, the Shannons were given couch numbers in a large room with the rest of their companions. Then a steward came around with a special candy which he told the passengers to eat to prevent their getting sick. Next, everyone was issued queer-looking shoes with metal soles. "'What are these for, Dad?' Sue wanted to know. She saw her father and brother exchange winks. "'She'll find out, won't she?' Mr. Shannon teased. As Steve and Sue lay on their soft couches and fastened plastic belts across their bodies, their father explained the purpose of this. We'll blast off at pretty fast speed, and if we weren't buckled down, we'd be thrown about and hurt. When the moment of blast-off came, Steve and Sue went through the most exciting experience of their lives. A loud roar filled their ears, and it felt suddenly as if the bottom of their stomachs had dropped out. They were pressed deeply into their couches, and they had the feeling of being flattened out as though under the foot of an elephant. Then slowly Steve and Sue felt the awful weight lifting from them, and finally it was gone altogether. Ugh! Oh, Sue groaned dizzily, unstrapping herself as the others were doing. What happened? When she tried to walk, she understood the purpose of the metal-soled shoes. We scarcely weigh anything now, her father explained. The magnetism of our souls is the only thing that keeps us from floating about like a feather. The guide, who said his name was Mr. Quinlan, led the sightseers to a huge window. The young Shannons gasped in wonder at what they saw. The sky was nearly pitch black and filled with more burning lights than they even guessed could exist. We're about a thousand miles above the earth, Mr. Quinlan said. We're out of the earth's atmosphere, and that's why the sky is dark and the stars so brilliant. Our rear jets are thrusting just barely enough to keep us from being pulled back to earth. The guide next said that they would go outside the ship in spacesuits. Sue and Steve whooped in joy, for they had not expected this. Mr. Quinlan distributed space gear from a cabinet. Then he explained how they were put on. After the flexible suits and plastic helmets were donned, everyone turned on his oxygen, which came from shoulder tanks. The others looked to Steve like balloon toys inflated with air, and he had to laugh as they waddled about. The tourists were led out of a side door onto a balcony which resembled a large fire escape. Everyone was told to buckle himself to the rail by a short length of cord in front of him. If one of us were to lose contact with the ship, Mr. Shannon warned his son and daughter, he'd go drifting off into space. Sue and Steve shuddered at the thought of this. Mr. Quinlan pointed out whirls of misty clouds that were called nebulas. He also showed them star clusters and the brighter planets. The sightseers had a close-up view of the earth that looked like a shimmering green ball. The guide did his speaking through a small radio attached to his suit. Each tourist had a receiver in his helmet, through which he could listen. For almost a full hour, Sue and Steve, together with the other spellbound passengers, took in the splendor of this strange, silent place, the vastness of which staggered the imagination. "'Isn't this a wonderful tribute to the greatness of God's creation?' Mr. Shannon said to his children. 
Steve and Sue had to agree with him wholeheartedly. When Mr. Quinlan was ready to go back into the ship, he tried the outside door switch, but the door failed to open. Over his two-way radio circuit, the passengers could hear a worried discussion between him and the pilot inside. They learned that a tube of compressed air which operated the outer door was jammed. There was nothing that could be done about it from the inside. Some of the women began sobbing, believing they would never return to earth again. Mr. Shannon looked at his son and daughter anxiously. "'Keep your chins up, kids,' he said. "'Nothing was ever gained by people losing their heads. I'm sure they'll figure out some way to save us.' Ah, uh, I'm not afraid, d Dad," Steve said bravely. There were tears of fright in Sue's brown eyes, but her small chin was courageously set, and she would not permit herself to give in to the terror she really felt. "'You're brave ones,' their father said, putting his big arms around their shoulders. Mr. Quinlan approached the Shannons. "'Mr. Shannon,' he said, "'I've got something important to talk over with you and your son.' The two listened closely as the guide outlined a daring plan. He pointed to a small circular opening some ten feet above the platform. He said that if a person could climb into the opening, he could turn an emergency valve that would double the air pressure and clear the jammed tube. Since Steve was the only boy on the platform, and therefore the smallest, Mr. Quinlan wanted to know if Steve would try it. Steve felt his heart fluttering crazily. He was both afraid and excited. "'There's only one danger, son,' the guide pointed out. "'You'll have to unfasten your safety line. If you think you can keep calm, though, there should be no real risk.' "'What will happen if the job isn't done?' Mr. Shannon asked grimly. Mr. Quinlan shrugged. "'There's not much that can be done. These suits will run out of oxygen in twenty minutes, and only your boy is slim enough to get inside the opening. Then, too, they can't land the ship without the risk of tossing us all out.' Mr. Shannon said quietly to Steve, "'Well, it's up to you, son. If you believe you can go through with it without losing your head and getting thrown from the ship—' Steve swallowed hard, thinking of the lives of the others around him that depended upon him. "'I'll try it,' he managed to say. He felt his knees go weak when the safety rope was unfastened from his waist, and he realized there was nothing now but his magnetic shoes to hold him to the ship. Carefully Mr. Quinlan boosted him up toward the opening above. Tick, tick, tick went his metal shoes against the shiny skin of the craft as he made his way upward by means of special climbing handles on the rocket hull. Keep calm, he told himself. A spaceman doesn't lose his head. He was thankful for the firm grip of his gloves as his fingers closed about the sides of the chamber, and he pulled himself up inside. It was a close fit, even for him. Mr. Quinlan had told him that usually the emergency valve was easily reached from the deck above, but that during this trip the deck was closed off for repairs and couldn't be entered. Steve found the valve handle and turned it as he was instructed. Almost immediately he heard the deafening blast of many voices in his receiver. Among the words he heard were, "'The door's opening!' Steve sighed deeply and carefully started down again. But the danger was not over yet. He still had to be very cautious. This was brought to him sickeningly when he drew his foot back with greater force than usual and found himself weaving backward into space. With a chill of terror, he grabbed a climbing handle and pulled himself snug against the ship's hull again. Finally, he felt the strong arms of his father on the lower part of his legs. He relaxed and was helped down onto the platform amid the cheers of everyone around. The sightseers, sobered by their close call, trooped silently back into the ship. A moment later the craft began dropping earthward, its jets acting as brakes to check the rapid descent. After landing, the Shannons were called into the office of the chief of operations at the spaceport. "'Young man,' the chief said to Steve, "'let me congratulate you for the brave thing you did.' He offered his hand, and Steve felt a flush of pride as he took the big palm in his own. "'Such an unselfish deed can never be fully repaid.' the chief went on. 
tell me steve do you like space going steve's eyes glowed with stars very much sir he said some day i'm going to become a spaceman myself then this little reward we have for you and your sister may help you reach your goal he held out a plastic sealed card steve took it as his heart raced it was a lifetime rocket pass end of story four story five of young readers science fiction stories by richard mace ellum this librivox recording is in the public domain story five wheel in the sky sue and steve shannon were riding with their father in a space ferry several thousand miles above the earth they could look out of the plastic windows of the little ship and see the winding curve of central america far below look steve sue exclaimed i see the panama canal there's a storm over the gulf of mexico steve said studying a big gray patch over the water it makes you feel like a king being so high above everything the atlantic and pacific were throbbing blue carpets topped by breakers of molten silver where the sunlight hit them it was a marvelous sight more like a scene from a fairyland there's the big spaceship we got off sue pointed out it's beginning to drop back to earth and there's the wheel in the sky steve said looking ahead we'll soon be there isn't it great compared to the tiny ship they were in which was shaped like a medicine capsule the wheel in the sky was a gigantic thing it looked like an automobile wheel and by its moving spokes the children saw that it was turning just like one why does the wheel spin dad steve asked that's in order to give the people inside of it a feeling of weight mr shannon explained as i told you before things in space have no weight because there is no gravity out here to speak of what happens when you ride on the merry-go-round on the school playground oh, you have to hold on tight or it'll throw you off steve answered the wheel in the sky does the same thing it tries to throw you off but since you are safely inside of it all it can do is throw your weight against the floor of the wheel understand the children nodded and smiled pleased at knowing one more fact about the strange ways of space as the ferry neared the big space station steve watched the black heavens all around them the stars were thicker than salt crystals and glittered like precious gems close to the wheel the ferry had to use its rockets in order to keep up with the spinning of the wheel presently a door in the rim of the wheel opened two men in space suits appeared in the doorway and threw out a line which stuck to the ferry by magnetism then the men pulled the little ship inside and closed the doors here we are the ferry pilot called to his passengers everybody out since there was fresh air in the hangar the riders did not have to use space suits just as his father had said steve found that he could walk around as easily as he did back in arkansas ready for a tour of the wheel kids mr shannon asked sure the twins replied together mr shannon worked for the american space supply company which carried supplies to the planets of the solar system this was the year two thousand four and by now nearly all the planets or their moons had budding earth colonies sue and steve had earned free lifetime space passes because of a heroic act steve had done a month before on the twins very first trip into space as mr shannon took the two around the man-made moon they were almost overcome by all the wonderful things they saw they learned that the wheel in the sky was both a scientific laboratory and a military lookout with their big telescopes the space guard could see every mile of earth for the wheel circled the globe several times a day while the shannons were in the military lookout room peering at the world through a telescope sue said i wish mom could be here with us i do too sis steve replied but it would take all the soldiers in the humpty dumpty story to get mom into a rocket wouldn't it dad mr shannon chuckled <laughs> i believe it would son their father leaned over and whispered something to the officer at the telescope who nodded the man slipped a high-powered lens on the telescope and turned it on a certain part of the united states toward which the wheel was slowly moving take another look sue her father said sue eagerly went to the eyepiece the telescope brought a city into very close range it seemed as if she had only to reach out a finger to touch the tall spire of a building 
and suddenly she gasped she knew that building it was the home office of her father's place of work the city was little rock arkansas their own home steve look she said excitedly to her brother and let him see for himself steve was as thrilled as sue together they moved the telescope lens over all the familiar spots of the great space city which in this day had a million population they were able to locate the wee speck that was their own home in the suburbs i can almost see mom hanging out the wash in the yard steve said with a grin before the children were through looking they noticed several black hazy spots in different parts of the state what are these dad steve asked showing them to his father they're tornadoes son mr shannon replied there seems to be an unusually large crop of them this season there are even some close to little rock the weather control bureau here has a way of dealing with them though they do many skillful things in weather control they can make it rain in dry parts of the world and even melt snow drifts in blizzard areas what can they do about a tornado steve asked when one threatens a city they fire a guided missile a bomb that breaks up the twister before it can do any harm we'll visit the weather control bureau as soon as we've been to the hub of the wheel mr shannon led them out of the military lookout room steve and sue then found a job of climbing facing them in order to reach the hub they had to go through one of the spokes leading into the center of the wheel the children saw before them a nylon ladder stretching as far as they could see down a long corridor let's start climbing their father said why can't we just walk along the hall sue asked instead of doing it the hard way you're forgetting that the wheel is always throwing you outward as it spins mr shannon said if you tried to walk down the spoke it would be like trying to walk against a hurricane for this reason you two must be careful not to lose your grip on the ladder or you'll be flung down the corridor against the rim the three began climbing hand over hand along the ladder they got along very well until sue suddenly became dizzy and lost her hold she screamed as she began flying down the corridor steve's heart nearly stopped beating for a moment he heard his father calling out loudly in a frantic voice grab the ladder sue grab the ladder at first sue did not seem to hear and kept hollering in fright then she understood and reached out wildly with her hands for the nylon ladder as she was swept along one hand seized a piece of it and she held on for dear life her body still hanging in mid-air as the force of the turning wheel kept trying to throw her outward hold on sue her father called we're coming he and steve swiftly crawled along the ladder to the spot where sue was clinging with one hand hurry she cried i can't hang on much longer just as she was about to let go steve reached her and held on to her with a free hand then his father lent his help and sue was safe she sobbed for a moment from the fright she had had and mr shannon suggested that they go back to the rim where they would be safe again both children agreed for they had suddenly lost all interest in the hub by the time they got to the weather control bureau they found more worry awaiting them men were hustling about the huge room with serious looks on their faces one of them was looking into the eyepiece of a large machine that was pointed out the window down onto earth what's wrong mr shannon asked one of the men a tornado is headed for little rock arkansas was the shocking reply i hope our missiles score a hit but it isn't going to be easy because the wheel has already moved past the united states the missiles got to hit steve burst out our home and mom are there yes it's simply got to sue added cheerfully the shannons had to stand helplessly on the side as the tornado fighters went to work the missile gun was in another part of the wheel but the orders for firing it would leave this room by radio oh why couldn't mom have come with us sue asked she would have been safe here steve felt his whole body tensing like a wound spring the perspiration was beating his forehead and his knees were weak on his father's face there was a dark look and steve saw that his big hands were opening and closing twenty seconds to go before firing the man at the machine said slowly over the radio mic on his chest steady eighteen seventeen oh, why don't they hurry sue cried they're so slow well they have to do it a certain way mr shannon answered they know what they're doing honey don't be afraid but she was afraid and so was steve and her father too 
every one in the room was afraid because no one could say whether the tornado could be destroyed before it hit the city or not eight seven six droned the unhurried voice of the operator the shannons hardly dared breathe for fear of disturbing the man at the machine steve felt sue's body quivering next to him it seemed as if the seconds were dragging on endlessly three two one fire steve felt nothing but he knew the tornado bomb was on its way speeding hundreds of miles a second earthward for long awfully long moments after the operator had said fire the shannons waited for him to speak again he kept looking calmly through the eyepiece of the machine as though just studying the stars then at last they saw a smile spread over his face and he said to everyone in the room it's a hit little rock is safe sue and steve whooped as if it were christmas morning where a moment before they had been greatly worried now they were happy as they never believed they could be whew mr shannon sighed i'm afraid i've had enough excitement to last me a lifetime not me dad steve said as the fire of adventure began to glow again in his eyes i won't be satisfied until i've seen what lies beyond the wheel in the sky end of story five Story six of Young Readers Science Fiction Stories by Richard Mace Elam. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story six Danger on the Ice Canal. Steve and Sue Shannon were at Marsport number thirteen. This was one of the many colonies on the planet Mars where Earth scientists were carrying on work it was a town of plastic tops called domes that were clear as glass the town was at the center of three canals that led outward into the red desert the shannon twins were now touring the largest dome with biff warren who worked for their father's space cargo company suddenly their tour brought them to a large cafeteria where many of the workers were eating mmm sue exclaimed smell that turkey yeah steve said it sure makes your mouth water doesn't it which reminds me biff said looking at his watch we'll have to finish up our sightseeing pretty soon the quicker we get back to your father's ship the quicker we can have our own turkey feast i can hardly wait for that sue sighed as the wonderful smell of the holiday meal kept tickling her nose when thanksgiving dinner was finished aboard the big space freighter that had brought the children to mars the ship would take off into space but before that biff sue and steve would have to go twenty miles back down the ice canal to reach the ship biff had become a close friend of the young shannons having made trips with them to other ports in space sue liked biff because of his quick smile and gentle patience steve liked him because he was all that steve would like to be some day himself a fearless bold spaceman they finished up their tour of the dome they saw the room where giant machines made oxygen out of chemicals and blew it through the building so that there was fresh air to breathe all the time and they saw the astronomy hall far up on top of the dome where scientists could see the heavens through the thin atmosphere much clearer than they could from earth isn't it about time for the fuel rocket to be shot off biff steve asked biff nodded i think it's just about time he said we'll suit up and go outside to see in the dressing room they put on their space suits as though they were his own children biff carefully checked the young shannon's air tanks built-in heaters and their helmet radios for talking to one another finally biff rubbed gelatin on their helmets so that they would not frost over in the cold that was a hundred degrees below zero outside they found space-suited figures gathered around the fuel rocket cannon the cannon was pointed toward a shiny ball high up in the purple black sky look sis there's the spaceship toward which they're going to shoot the fuel rocket steve said i see it sue cried her eyes dancing excitedly they have to line up the cannon with the ship just right or the rocket won't reach it biff said won't the rocket hit the ship steve asked no it'll lose all its speed by the time it reaches the ship biff told him then they'll take on fuel from the rocket by means of a long hose suddenly the three of them heard a loud roar and saw a burst of flame like a bullet the rocket left the muzzle of the giant gun and rose into the sky 
they'll be shooting off more rockets before they have enough fuel for the spaceship biff said there'll be a little wait in between each firing look biff isn't the spaceship right over the canal where we'll be heading back steve asked that's right steve biff answered you'll remember our ship is at the end of the canal we'll be able to see the rockets go off as we head back which we'd better do right now if we're going to have any turkey and pumpkin pie the canals of mars had been carved out of a great desert by water and fierce winds because of the ice that filled them they made good highways the three went to the canal bank to see if their sled was ready to go and it was the sled looked like a big bombing plane with the wings off instead of wheels there were long runners beneath it in this sled biff and his young helpers had brought supplies to the colony several hours before steve sue and biff climbed into the front seat then biff shut the door he pushed buttons in front of them steve and sue felt the sled's engines throbbing the next moment the sled shot off over the smooth sheet of ice biff holding tightly to the steering wheel Wee! sue screamed in delight off we go like a roller coaster steve shouted they sped along at a hundred miles an hour this was as much fun as they had had on their last space journey each of their trips into space seemed to be more exciting than the last they had won a lifetime free pass into space and by now they were sure they would need a lifetime in which to see all of its many wonders a brave act by steve on their first space trip had earned them their pass right now steve thought that their mother and home back in arkansas seemed as far away as deneb the north star of mars we'll be there in about ten minutes biff said the ship leaves in thirty which gives us some spare time look sue said there comes the first fuel rocket back down in a parachute that's right sue biff replied steve studied the bank of the canal along it he saw a scrubby cactus which was forever fighting for life in the cold dry atmosphere beyond the bank stretched acres of red wasteland and sand drifts piled up by strong winds that never stopped blowing a few minutes later sue noticed a bright streak against the purple sky it was nearly as bright as the tiny sun which was so far away that it could not keep mars warm there goes another fuel rocket sue called out pointing through the windshield as biff caught sight of it he jerked up sharply in his seat bumping the shoulders of sue and steve on both sides of him that rocket's too low he exclaimed it's not lifting something's gone wrong steve felt chills run up his spine he was seeing the danger too now the rocket was dropping ahead of them a screaming bomb filled with explosive fuel it was still quite a distance away but even steve knew that it would make a terrible blast when it struck the ice biff's feet hit the brakes of the sled and the runners chewed into the hard ice pack shrieking and bringing the sled to a skidding stop the riders were slammed forward sue and steve were dazed but not hurt when steve's mind cleared he saw that biff had thrown himself over in front of sue and him to protect them but in doing this his helmet had thumped against the windshield he was now slumped over and not moving sue steve cried biff is hurt just then they felt the shock of the explosion it tilted the sled at an angle and dropped it down again with a hard jolt the air was filled with flying chunks of ice it looked like a hailstorm outside the ice clattered against the windshield like stones sue and steve were relieved when it finally stopped but the explosion had left the ice sheet in front of them broken and choked with lumps of ice steve sue moaned what are we going to do steve looked at biff who was still not moving he could see a big lump on biff's forehead where his head had struck the helmet knocking him out the children tried to revive their friend but could not we've got to get the sled to the ship ourselves sue her brother said biff may need a doctor besides i bet we've all missed our thanksgiving dinner i won't want any dinner if biff is hurt badly sue said cheerfully at first it seemed like an impossible thing for a pair of twelve-year-olds to run the big sled but steve remembered how biff had worked the controls and he believed he too could do it 
he changed seats with the unconscious spaceman and tried the levers and buttons presently the sled's rockets began to pour fire out of the rear but steve couldn't get the sled to move he was afraid it had been damaged then sue showed him a lever to push which she had remembered seeing biff shove as steve worked it gently the sled started off slowly we'll go slow steve said and take it very easy the explosion had hit at the far edge of the canal so that there was a narrow space on the other side where the ice was still smooth steve carefully guided the sled along the canal and through the unbroken part when there was smooth ice before them steve picked up speed a little as he drove sue tried to awaken biff steve would have found their adventure a lot of fun if things weren't so serious at the moment it wasn't every day that a boy had the chance to drive a giant rocket sled on a distant planet at last steve saw the round top of the spaceship just over the horizon it was at that moment that sue called out the good news biff's awakening steve the boy saw their friend slowly rise up then shake his head to clear it when he smiled at them in his pleasant way they were sure that he was going to be all right by the time they had told him what had happened he was his old self again he took the controls and looked at his watch time's running out he said we've got to hit top speed again hold on to your helmets here we go and off they went at lightning speed once more it seemed to steve as if they covered the distance between them and the spaceship in seconds as the sled came to a gentle stop beneath the giant freighter biff said it looks like we'll make our thanksgiving dinner on time after all doesn't it kids yeah steve answered and this is certainly one thanksgiving that i'm really thankful i know what you mean steve sue said thoughtfully we're thankful that we're alive biff and steve both nodded it was a holiday none of them would ever forget end of story six Story 7 of Young Readers Science Fiction Stories by Richard Mace Elam. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 7 Cargo for Callisto. The big rocket freighter was speeding through the stardust of outer space. It was carrying supplies to Callisto, one of the twelve moons of Jupiter, and the Shannons on another space adventure steve and sue looked out a window of the freighter at the airless world growing in size callisto was a gigantic roughened rock but it was a globe larger than the planet mercury it reminded steve of a giant cockleburr hanging in the sky suddenly the children heard a tiny voice behind them say rocket away they turned and sue exclaimed it's bud the blue parakeet a budgie blinked lazily at them the twins had met Mr. Whittle's pet a week ago. He had taken a liking to them from the very start. They didn't know that a few hours from now their very lives would depend on this little fellow. "'We'd better take him back to Mr. Whittle,' Steve said. The budgie kept studying them with his flat face and blinking his tiny button eyes, and then he squawked again, "'Rocket away!' "'It'll be rocket away for you, young fellow,' Steve said sternly. "'Up on my finger, bud.' The bird did as he was ordered. They took him down the hall to Mr. Whittle's room. Bud's owner, off duty now, was a tall, spidery crewman with a big Adam's apple. He always gave his pet full run of the ship. Mr. Whittle whistled to the parakeet, but the bird stayed on Steve's finger. Mr. Whittle chuckled. Hey, I believe he likes you two better than his master. Oh, we like him too, Sue told the crewman you can keep him for a few days if you want to mr whittle said i'm going to be pretty busy after we land gee we'd like to look after him steve answered if you take him outside on callisto you'll have to put him in that airtight cage over there i had made it's sort of like a spacesuit for him sue and steve played with bud in the room they used for games until it was time to strap down for landing then they went to the couch hall and lay down on cots like the other space travelers were doing. They buckled straps across their bodies to keep them in place. For a long time Steve and Sue lay there as the big freighter began cutting its rushing speed. It felt to Steve as if a giant anvil were crushing downward on his chest. 
Take-off and landing were always the roughest moments in space travel, as the twins had already found out on other space trips. At last the ship set down on Callisto. The young Shannons went back to the game room. Then, with the bird on Steve's shoulder, the twins looked out the window at the strange new world. They saw a land bathed in ghostly twilight. Very little light was coming from the sun. It was so far away that it was only a small circle. Most of the light came from a huge shape that looked like somebody's lost beach ball resting on the ground. Its bottom edge just touched the horizon. Sue and Steve were joined by their father, who worked for the space freight company. "'That's His Majesty Jupiter, the king of the planets,' Mr. Shannon told them. "'He's over a million miles away, and yet he looks close enough to touch, doesn't he?' "'Let's go outdoors, Dad,' Steve begged. "'No reason why we can't,' Mr. Shannon replied. After they had put on their space clothes, Steve popped Bud into his warm, airtight cage. As they went outside, they saw the crewman unloading the cargo. "'There's the colony over there,' Mr. Shannon said, pointing to a high framework that looked something like an oil derrick. "'They mine here for a mineral called magna. It's very valuable because without it we couldn't have atomic engines. Magna is what keeps our rocket tubes from melting under the terrific heat that goes through them.' "'May we go down into the mines, Dad?' Steve asked. "'Well, we'll see if we can,' said his father. As they walked toward the mining place, Mr. Shannon said, "'Underneath us are pockets of poisonous gas, like that found in Jupiter's atmosphere. Sometimes it leaks into the mining tunnels, causing danger from suffocation.' "'I sure hope the gas stays where it belongs while we're down there,' Steve said, and swallowed the lump of fear in his throat. They turned their attention to Jupiter. It looked even more like a beach ball now, with its stripes of beautiful colors. Mr. Shannon said the bands were floating icebergs of the poisonous gases he was talking about. "'No ship can land on Jupiter,' he said. "'Its gravity would crush a spaceman flat. Gravity pull is much stronger on the larger planets, you know. Jupiter's atmosphere is many thousands of miles deep. Raging storms are going on beneath it all the time.' "'Oh!' sue gasped i guess we're close enough to it then other wonders of the sky were the round beacons of jupiter's other moons three of which were about the same size as callisto they hung like bright searchlights in the starry heavens the men at the mining place greeted the shannons warmly they had not seen anyone from earth for so long that they had grown very lonely the chief mining engineer said he would be glad to take the visitors on an underground tour his name was Dr. Harding. He was plump and short and wore black-rimmed glasses inside his space helmet. He led them into an elevator, and it sank into the darkness. Steve remembered about the poisonous gases that crept about underground, and it made him shiver to think about it. Dr. Harding watched Bud hopping around uncomfortably inside his small space cage. "'Do you remember, Mr. Shannon?' he asked over his suit radio, "'when they used to use canary birds in mines to warn about leaking gas. "'The birds would notice it first and give the miners time to get out.' Oh, "'I've read about that, Dr. Harding,' said Mr. Shannon. "'Now we have automatic warning machines in the tunnels to do that,' the chief engineer told Sue and Steve. Deeper and deeper below the soil of Callisto the elevator sank, at last the cage touched the bottom, and riders found themselves in a large cavern. There were machines and men all about, working busily. Tracks led off into tunnels, and ore cars were running on them. Some were going empty into the tunnels, while others were coming out full of rock and gravel. The magna is separated from the rock in that big machine over there, Dr. Harding explained. Want to ride an ore car into one of the tunnels? sure steve spoke up the mine is air-conditioned the chief engineer said so we can take off our helmets this done steve let bud out of his cage the little bird hopped up on his gloved finger saying rocket away several times his two-word language seemed to do for everything one worker controlled all the cars at a main switch in the middle of the cavern the shannons and their guide climbed into an empty ore car and it rolled into a tunnel glistening dark rock crowded in on sue and steve from all sides 
Steve hoped the walls were strong enough so they would not come crashing down on their heads. There were lights along the way to help brighten the gloom. After clicking along like a trolley for a while, the car came to the end of the line. It was a large room with more machines and workmen. The men were digging magna ore out of the wall with drills. As Dr. Harding explained about the work, Bud began flitting about as though sightseeing on his own. He was shy of the workers at first, but then made friends with them. He spoke to them with his favorite two words, and the men laughed in great fun to hear him. Then, a few minutes later, Bud began acting queerly. He flew back to Steve's finger and started wobbling as though dizzy. "'What's the matter with him?' Steve asked. "'He's sick or something,' Sue cried out. She took the budgie from Steve and cuddled him in her own gloves, but the little blue bird seemed to be no better. Dr. Harding walked over to look at the bird. Then he ordered, "'Everybody into the ore car. We have to get out of here fast. Sue, hold the bird up close to your suit.' The workers dropped their tools as if they were red-hot and climbed into the car. Mr. Shannon helped Sue and Steve on, then jumped on himself. Dr. Harding pressed the electric button that was the signal to the operator in the main cavern to move the car. The car began to roll down the track. It picked up speed as Dr. Harding kept pressing the button. "'Leaking gas, Dr. Harding?' Mr. Shannon asked worriedly. The chief engineer nodded. He sniffed the air like a hunting dog after a scent. "'Take a deep breath, everyone, then hold it.' Steve thought his lungs would burst, but finally Dr. Harding let them take another deep breath. By the time they had taken one more, the car had reached the main cavern. As it rolled to a stop, Dr. Harding jumped down and ran over to the car operator. Steve saw a door slide down and close off the tunnel where they had come out. Then the little man gave a deep sigh and took off his black-rimmed glasses to wipe them. Sue and Steve watched Bud hopefully. He was standing more steadily on Sue's finger now. "'I think he'll be all right,' the chief engineer said. "'We sure owe Bud a lot for warning us the way he did. Something must have happened to the warning machine. It was supposed to set off a siren. If it weren't for Bud, we might have been overcome before we could have gotten out of there,' Mr. Shannon said. "'You're so right,' Dr. Harding said. "'The men will go back in there in gas masks to find the leak and see what's wrong with the warning machine.' "'We're plenty lucky,' Steve sighed, his spine still prickly from their narrow escape. Sue kissed the budgie. "'You're a hero, Bud,' she told him, "'and we love you.' Bud blinked lazily. Then, as if to show that he was all right again, he squawked, "'Rocket away!' End of Story 7 Story 8 of Young Readers' Science Fiction Stories by Richard Mace Elam. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 8. The Big Show on Titan. The space freighter had landed on Titan, the largest moon in all the solar system. The Shannon twins had been anxious to reach this moon of Saturn because their father had told them that something very exciting might happen here before they left. There was another reason why the children had looked forward to the landing. They would meet a boy of their own age who was the son of a worker. He had been living on Titan for the last two years and would be able to show them around. Steve and Sue came down the outside gangway of the cargo ship and stepped onto the frozen ground of the distant world. The twins wore spacesuits, of course, for the air outside was extremely cold and it was poisonous as well with raw methane and ammonia. Steve saw beautiful Saturn with its colored rings filling much of the blue sky. Titan was a world of close mountains, worn smooth by lots of windy weather. A film of glistening ice covered the peaks like caps of glass. "'Look up there, Sue,' Steve said. "'Over our heads. That's the famous skyport of Titan.' "'I wish we could go up there,' Sue said. "'Maybe we'll get a chance,' answered Steve." Ahead of them stood a rounded plastic dome. Men were carrying into it cartons of supplies which the space freighter had brought. The twin's father, who was an official of the American Space Supply Company, was still aboard to take care of the unloading. A boy came out of the domed building. "'Are you the Shannons?' he asked over his space radio. "'Yes, we are,' Steve replied. "'I'm Bobby King.' Sue and Steve said they were glad to meet him. 
he asked if they would like to go up and see the skyport both the young shannons answered a quick sure together they followed their new friend into the plastic dome bobby king pointed to an overhead cable hanging from the heavy cord was a cable car all aboard bobby called like a train conductor sue and steve giggled with pleasure as they entered the car followed by bobby bobby pushed a switch and the cable car began to move we're going up like a corkscrew bobby said round and round right out of the top of the building moved the cable car up and up it went it took about ten minutes to reach the top as soon as they got out two men passed them who were talking about a storm that was on the way boy if there's a storm coming you two are sure in luck bobby told sue and steve steve and sue looked at one another puzzled why should their young friend be pleased over a coming storm they saw before them a space that looked as flat as a highway and larger than a football field there was a row of hangars along the far side wow we sure must be high steve burst out they seem to be almost on a level with the mountains we're a whole mile off the ground bobby told him the skyport rests on the corners of two mountain ridges they went over to one of the clear plastic walls that edged the skyport gee the freighter sure is little down there sue said it almost took steve's breath away the big spaceship indeed looked no larger than a toy down below why did they go to such trouble to build this steve asked because there wasn't any space flat enough on the ground bobby answered my father says they need a main skyport on titan because there are so many companies here digging for uranium the colonists fly here to get their supplies and mail i see some dark clouds over the mountains sue said does that mean a storm is coming bobby's helmet nodded it sure does you two are the luckiest ones you got here right at the start of the storm season steve and sue were still puzzled as to why bobby wanted it to storm bobby showed his guests a faint star burning through the blue atmosphere that's earth he told them seven hundred and fifty million miles away my father thinks we can go back for a visit in a few weeks i'll be glad where do you live here bobby sue asked my father and i stay in an apartment a little way from here bobby answered how about school steve wanted to know do they have one on titan bobby shook his head my father teaches me he's out with some prospectors today bobby showed them titan's other nine sister moons which looked like glowing fireballs steve saw that most of the daylight came from saturn because the sun was so far away it wasn't nearly as bright here as it was on earth i wish we could run over to saturn for a visit sue said jokingly oh you don't really sue bobby told her you couldn't stand up in its heavy gravity saturn's almost as big as jupiter you know what are saturn's rings made of steve asked oodles and oodles of rocks bobby replied they are traveling so fast that they make the rings look like one solid piece wind was beginning to howl around them and this seemed to make bobby very excited the coming storm must be something special steve thought his curiosity had been aroused strongly the clouds gathered darker and more thickly behind the mountains the wind was driving harder hadn't we better go inside sue asked worriedly shucks no bobby said it won't be any fun unless we're right out in it there won't be any rain it's too cold on titan for rain suddenly the three heard a loud siren wail that means a jet plane is coming in bobby said all planes have to land when word of a storm gets round the plane's wheels touched down and the ship rolled along until a hook on it caught a line that stretched across the runway the line brought the plane to a sharp halt the jet's wings were folded down and the ship was pushed off to a hangar two more ships landed afterward then a blinding flash lighted up the sky it made steve and sue blink and jump in fright look bobby exclaimed the storm has begun other men had come out to see what was going to happen and they lined up along the edges of the skyport with the children bobby pointed to a sparkling balloon of light that burst into a blossom of sparks over the mountains a moment later a red dagger flash skipped across the peaks during all this there were loud crashes and rumblings 
Steve was scared and thrilled at the same time. It's just like fireworks, Sue called out. Now Steve could understand why Bobby had looked forward to the storm. He guessed, too, that this was the exciting surprise their father had said might happen while they were there. An orange pinwheel, like a Fourth of July sparkler, rose from a mountain top and looped upward. It grew bigger and bigger and fainter and fainter at the same time. It was really a beauty. "'What causes the fireworks?' Steve asked above the noise. "'Partly strong wind,' Bobby said loudly, "'and partly Titan's gases exploding against the mountain tops." They watched spellbound for fifteen minutes, then a half hour. The Shannons were sure they had never seen anything quite so breathtaking as this. At one time a row of peaks seemed to glow with a sheet of red flame. The flame danced and flickered like a forest fire for a long time before it faded out. The children had been enjoying themselves so thoroughly that they knew nothing of the peril that was heading their way. The first warning came when one of the Skyport men standing nearby shouted over his spacesuit radio. Steve whirled in alarm. His heart seemed to stop beating completely for a terrible moment. A tardy plane had come in for a landing on the sky platform, but the howling wind had kept everyone from hearing the warning siren. Because of the fierce blowing, the plane had not hooked firmly to the braking line. It scooted off to the side and was heading for the very spot where Bobby, Steve, and Sue stood. Bobby! Steve cried. Get out of the way! As Bobby ducked for safety, Steve also moved quickly. Sue screamed as Bobby grabbed her hastily by her space glove. He had to jerk her sharply in order to get her out of the path of the runaway plane. The plane crashed into the plastic wall of the skyport, tearing out a section of a wall as though it were thin cardboard. The ship was left dangling on the very edge, as if ready to fall a mile to the ground. The poor pilot, Sue cried. Oh, I can't look. But the skyport men had come running quickly over, and together they pulled the jet plane back to safety. They helped the scared pilot out. He walked shakily off into one of the hangars. Whew, that was close, Steve breathed, for him and us, too. My heart is still thumping like a drum, Bobby said. As for Sue, she was too upset to say anything at all. They turned to look at the fireworks to take their minds off the accident. The wonderful ending of the show almost made them forget it completely. They saw a dazzling white light burst like an empty volcano. The banner of fire rose as high into the sky as huge Saturn, then it spilled over like a great fountain. It changed into purple, then blue, green, and red. Before dying out, it gave the big planet a lovely ruddy glow, showing up its rings like a gleaming necklace of rubies. That was the end of nature's grand performance. Wow, wasn't that terrific, Steve asked. A show like that in a grandstand on Earth would cost you three and a half. Maybe four, Sue chimed in. You can't see this show anywhere on Earth, Steve, Bobby said. Titan is the only place, and the good thing about it is that it's all for free. End of Story 8 Story 9 of Young Reader Science Fiction Stories by Richard Mace Elam This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. STORY Nine: ADVENTURE ON THE SUN'S DOORSTEP Sue and Steve Shannon watched the magic world of stardust through a port of the rocket freighter. The ship was moving under power of its atomic engines, headed toward the sun. They had one more cargo stop to make before returning to their beloved soil on the earth. The twins heard the clack of magnetic souls behind them. Without such shoes holding them to the floor, space travelers would float about helplessly like wingless birds. "'Hi, kids,' greeted their father, growing tired of the view. "'I guess I am, Dad,' Steve admitted. His blue eyes were tired. "'How far away is Apollo's chariot now?' Sue asked. Mr. Shannon grinned. "'That's the umpteenth time you two have asked that. But I suppose I'm as restless as you are to get back to Mom in Arkansas.' Hearing this made Steve suddenly homesick. There was really no place like home, just like the poet had said. Steve knew Sue felt the same way. 
he had seen a wistful look in her hazel eyes every time they had talked of little rock the seemingly endless days finally did end the three shannons went up into the lookout dome with the crewmen the dome was covered by a darkened plastic screen to cut down the blinding glare of the sun which was very close it was a heart-stopping sight for sue and steve the planet mercury covered the face of the sun like a black plate streaming out from the edges were mountainous tongues of living fire mr shannon called this flaming halo the sun's chromosphere gee what a thing to see steve gasped it's it's unbelievable sue added breathless indeed it is mr shannon agreed see that thing like a lighted wheel just ahead of us that's apollo's chariot it was named after the famous greek sun god you know sue and steve knew that apollo's chariot was really a space laboratory that was a home for scientists who were studying the sun they had been the ones who had given their tiny world its colorful nickname it was protected with asbestos and other special material to shield it from the heat as it circled the great star month after month year after year we had to contact apollo's chariot while mercury was shading our ship from the sun's rays mr shannon said we aren't protected like apollo's chariot is mercury seems as big as the sun the way it covers it completely steve remarked that's because we're so close to mercury his father explained actually the sun is so much bigger it's like comparing a pinpoint to a grapefruit in the midnight darkness between the ships giant searchlights had to be turned on then the scientists on the other ship came out onto their loading platform to receive their cargo conversation was carried on by means of spacesuit radios with those aboard the freighter who stood on their own outside platform why can't we get closer to apollo's chariot steve asked biff warren who was the twins favorite among the crewmen biff was piling boxes and crates at the edge of the platform space regulations answered biff if a meteor should hit one of us the other ship would explode too if we were too close also rocket tubes are so tricky that you never know when one is going to misfire and send your ship scooting off suddenly in the wrong direction one end of a double cable was fastened to rings on the freighter's platform then the other end was tossed across the space between the two ships and attached by the scientists to their own side steve saw the crewmen around him pick up cords from out of the cable equipment box they fastened one end to buckles on their suits and the other to the cable steve guessed that the lines were a safety measure to keep the men from drifting off into space as they carried the cargo across the first crewman picked up a crate as lightly as if it were a pile of feathers then with his foot he shoved off from the platform he guided the crate through the emptiness with his gloved hands and the men on the opposite platform helped him aboard another crewman stepped off the freighter with another crate then another crewman with another piece of cargo the carriers returned by the other cable line steve went over to his dad who as an official of the american space supply company was supervising the work as always dad may sue and i carry a box across we'll be careful mr shannon thought a moment i suppose it will be all right there's no way you can go adrift if you fasten on to the cable but you have to be careful you're snapped on securely mr shannon made a place for them in line sue in front there was a wait before sue's turn so that more crates could be placed on the platform's edge the children looked beyond apollo's chariot at the huge black circle of mercury as it masked the mighty sun biff steve asked his friend as he was stacking the crates why couldn't the apollo scientists study the sun from mercury biff chuckled and it made a funny crackling sound over the young shannon's radio men will land on mercury when they grow hides of asbestos steve it's so hot on the sunward side that there are supposed to be lakes and pools of lead there the other side never sees the sun so you can imagine how cold it is think you two would like to go there i should say not sue answered for both of them when the next piece of cargo was ready to go over biff checked the children's safety cords then he let sue push off from the platform with a box in front of her a few moments later steve followed 
the boy heard his sister giggle excitedly as they floated across searchlight beams were in their eyes but they didn't mind steve too thought this great fun after being cramped for so long on the freighter he looked down at the empty space below but he knew he could not fall and so was not afraid reaching the other platform he and his sister were helped aboard they sure are using young crewmen these days joked one of the scientists a tall man who seemed to be working harder than the others nice work young folks the scientist was in the act of changing the children's cords over to the returning cable when a slight mishap occurred one of the crates coming over bumped into him he laughed as he again got to his feet but his laughter quickly changed to alarm when sue suddenly pushed off from the platform she had thought her cable line was secure and that she was ready to make the exciting trip back across the gulf wait miss the scientist called i didn't finish fastening your cable cord he reached for sue but her suit slipped out of the fingers of his bulky space gloves steve froze for an instant in terror at what he had seen then without thought of anything else except his sister's danger he dove right off the platform after sue not realizing or caring that his own cable cord was not fastened if the scientist had not grabbed for sue she might have floated safely across to the freighter but by touching her he had sent her off in a direction beneath it over his radio steve heard her screaming for help and saw her flinging her arms and legs about like a drowning swimmer steve was moving faster than she and presently caught up with her what are we going to do steve she cried holding tightly to him we can't stop and it's so dark out here steve knew that unless someone came to their aid they would drift on and on since there was no air to slow them down but he didn't tell sue this he remembered as he had at times before that a spaceman must keep his head in an emergency he spoke comforting words to sue telling her to try to be calm that help would be coming even as he told her this a spear of light hit them and a voice broke in on their radio steve sue stop struggling i'm on my way to you biff steve exclaimed and the dread in his heart suddenly lifted he looked over his shoulder and saw their big friend approaching guided by the light that had been flashed on them from the freighter there was a little plume of flame trailing behind him in a few minutes he had caught up with them sue was so glad to see him she grabbed the big spaceman and her helmet bumped against his in an attempted kiss oh i'm so glad to see you biff she sobbed i was so awfully scared you're all right now biff said gently both of you hold on to me and we'll go back steve took biff's left arm and sue firmly grasped one of steve's biff carried a type of hand rocket called a pusher that he had used to shoot himself along toward them by pointing the rocket in the opposite direction from which he wanted to go the pusher pushed him in the manner of the rocket tubes on the freighter biff pointed the pusher away from the freighter steve saw a burst of fire beside them and the three of them sped off toward the big ship as sue reached the platform her father was there to help her aboard she could see in his eyes the fear he had felt for them steve was surprised to have the crew greet him warmly with pats on the back the boy turned to his father why are they calling me a hero he asked it was biff who saved us not taking credit away from biff any good spaceman would have done what he did said mr shannon but few would have attempted your trick of jumping into space after your sister with no way of getting back right biff biff nodded his plastic helmet it wasn't the smartest thing you could have done steve but it showed your bravery courage counts just as much as ability in a spaceman don't ever forget that son steve who wanted to be a spaceman some day would not forget it. End of story nine. Story ten of Young Reader's Science Fiction Stories by Richard Mace Elam. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story ten The Flying Mountain. Steve and Sue were playing a game as the freighter headed through space toward Earth. It was fun trying to see who could build the higher tower of sticks the young shannons were in extra good spirits 
before long they would be seeing mom and their home in arkansas after being in space for so many months steve carefully placed the last stick on his tower which was almost as high as he could reach i won sis he exclaimed but as he drew his hand away it brushed against the tower causing the sticks to drift off in all directions i won sue cried gleefully yours broke up steve made a face and began picking the sticks out of the air before they floated too far it was lack of weight in space that made it possible to play such a game the twins would have hung in the air like the sticks if their shoe soles were not held to the floor by magnetism i'll beat you next time steve boasted before they could start again their father came into the room it looks as though we may not be getting home as quickly as we had expected kids captain Furman has received an s o s from a passenger rocket that's down on the asteroid sierra the twins knew an asteroid to be one of the thousands of tiny planets in the solar system are we going to her aid steve asked it depends on whether we have enough fuel or not his father replied even atomic fuel runs out sometime you know captain Furman is talking with his officers now it'll be a shame if we can't help the pole star as much as i want to see mom it was just like his unselfish dad to say that steve thought he felt the same way about it and he didn't doubt that tender-hearted sue was of the same mind mr shannon started out of the room again i'm going to see what they're going to do steve and sue went back to their game but somehow it wasn't as much fun now people were in trouble and trouble in space was often a frightening thing it seemed like a long time before their father came back he walked in so fast that his magnetic soul sounded like tiny hammers kids he said the captain wants to see you us steve asked that's right come quickly they went out leaving some sticks in mid-air and others drifting off the young shannons walked shyly into the captain's room where all the officers stood steve felt out of place among the neatly uniformed spacemen mr shannon was in charge of cargo which the freighter dropped off at different ports in space for he was an official of the american space supply company but he had nothing to do with the running of the ship young folks said the tall captain who had a blond mustache we want you to help us solve a problem sir steve asked puzzled here it is went on the chief in his booming voice if we go on past earth to sierra to help the pole star it'll leave us with only a fifty-fifty chance of having enough fuel to reach earth but the pole star is running short of supplies and the radio just went dead a while ago it's too late to get help from earth the crew is divided on what we should do so i decided to call you two in to see what you think a husky crewman spoke out boldly what do these kids know about space captain they're not even old enough to be out here i say stick to our course and get this crew and ship back safely to earth the remark angered steve but the spaceman looked too big to talk back to sue wasn't so timid you ought to be ashamed of yourself she exclaimed thinking of yourself when other people are in trouble steve and his father were surprised at sue's outburst captain Furman and the other crewmen smiled i think that solves our problem the captain spoke firmly if the young lady has courage enough to overlook the risk the rest of us should have it too thank you sue we move at full rocket thrust to aid the pole star as the shannons went out into the corridor steve asked his sister wow sue what made you talk back to that big fellow like that he was so selfish sue answered besides it made me mad to hear him say we didn't know anything about space why we've been over almost all of the solar system haven't we dad her father pressed her shoulder of course honey i'm proud of you because i felt the same way it took a few days for the freighter to reach the asteroid the spaceship in going past the earth had come close enough for the earth to be seen as a misty green light it made the twins long for home as they saw it sierra is like a big meteor isn't it dad steve asked as the three of them looked downward on that flat egg-shaped rock his father nodded it's often called the flying mountain because of the low peaks on it sierra is only a mile long and less than that wide 
i remember from school that it wasn't discovered until 1965 sue said that's because it's so small and it isn't very bright in the sky her father spoke most of the asteroids are much farther out between mars and jupiter but a few come in close to earth like sierra hermes eros and some others the freighter landed safely in a flat area about two hundred feet from the pole star the shannons could see the damaged spaceship jammed against a cliff brilliant sunshine reflected upward from bare dark rock dazzling their eyes it was over a hundred degrees on sierra for there was no atmosphere to check the sun's heat boy what a place for a sunburn steve said it's certainly summertime on sierra sue added they watched crewmen in space suits come out of the freighter and began uncoiling a spool of rope that was stretched between the two ships safety lines led from all the men back to the cargo ship there's almost no gravity at all here mr shannon told his son and daughter because the asteroid is so small if the people from the pole star providing there are any alive didn't have the rope to hang on to they might float right off sierra the children asked to go outside the three suited up and went out using safety lines just in case the glare was so strong that they had to lower their darkening glasses over the face part of their helmets the heat was such that they had to switch on the cooling outfits in their suits it was strange to see the edge of the asteroid so close just beyond a fringe of dagger-like peaks it was like being on a big space raft the twins tried walking they were less than feather light and it was quite a job for them even to keep upright sue decided this wouldn't be a very good place to spend the summer vacation sue's cooling outfit made her sneeze she was lifted right off the ground and her father had to pull her down quickly she and steve laughed but they had been scared see it doesn't take much to send you sky high mr shannon joked speaking over the radio set which all three of them carried in their spacesuits at last the crewmen who had been moving so carefully over the ground toward the pole star reached the ship and fastened the rope to it the outer door of the pole star was then opened by someone inside thank goodness somebody's alive in there mr shannon said thankfully i guess the ship just coasted into the rock wall without too much force the freighter crew began helping people out of the passenger rocket if things weren't so serious it would have been funny for sue and steve to see them in their balloon-like space suits bouncing one careful step at a time and holding on for dear life to the rope as the party neared the freighter the twins suddenly saw their father dash toward the ship in his haste mr shannon seemed to have forgotten where he was and went scooting upward like a high jumper dad sue and steve cried out together mr shannon had to put out his hands and feet at the last minute to keep from crashing into the wall of the freighter then he pulled himself down to the ground with his safety line when they saw that their father was unhurt sue and steve began walking toward the ship with careful steps they heard their dad exclaim mr ballinger as he walked over to one of the men from the pole star john shannon the man said it turned out that mr ballinger was the president of the american space supply company and was mr shannon's boss mr ballinger explained that the pole star was heading for mars when there was an explosion in the rocket tubes by landing on sierra the captain thought there was a better chance of their being found than if they had just kept drifting in space because all ships knew the path of the flying mountain no one had been hurt in the landing and the pole star had enough fuel to get the freighter back to earth i don't know whether i should fire you people or not for risking my good freighter just to save an old codger like me the friendly mr ballinger joked well we almost didn't steve's dad reminded him and explained how sue's outburst had decided the problem you certainly got some smart ones there john mr ballinger said smiling at sue and steve your son has already proved himself a hero before and now it's sue yes sir i sure wish i had a pair like them but the twins scarcely heard him 
They were thinking that, in spite of the great fun they had had on all their space adventures, how wonderful it was going to be to see Mom again and set foot on the grandest planet in all the solar system, Earth. End of story 10